Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us today. This is our first event as a joint effort between the Indo-Swiss Center of Excellence and the Maritime Research Center. Today, we are taking this opportunity uh, to host this seminar and come webinar uh, hybrid mode uh, at the Maratha Chamber. We are extremely <clears throat> grateful to the Maratha Chamber for uh, letting this happen. And uh, the uh, <clears throat> Mr. Mukesh Malhotra, sir, will be talking about this collaboration. But I just wanted to get it started. And now I will hand over to Mr. Mukesh Malhotra, sir, to give the welcome address. Mr. Varma and all the distinguished people, both in present in, in personal presence as well as online. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this seminar come webinar on behalf of the Indo-Swiss Center of Excellence uh, that is being set up or has been set up in Pune. Just a few words about what the Indo-Swiss Center of Excellence is all about. Uh, this is a center of excellence for uh, having three verticals. It had two, now it has three, uh, set up to skill the youth of today with the skills of tomorrow. Basically, the first vertical is a vertical in agriculture, where our main goal is to double the income of a marginal farmer having one to one and a half acre of land. And we have graduated about 1,700 students in that field. And we have actually increased their incomes from about 80, 90,000 a year to about two lakhs to two and a half lakhs per year. The second vertical is uh, modern manufacturing technologies, which is basically all the skills of tomorrow, which include mechatronics, electric mobility, uh, robotics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, 3D printing, etc. And uh, you know these are all the skills of tomorrow which are direly needed for Industry 4.0, which is coming uh, you know very soon. So rather than concentrate on skills of yesterday. Uh, like milling and and uh, you know lathe machining, we thought that we should concentrate on the skills of tomorrow. On the same lines, uh, I have been involved with the uh, you know Indian Maritime Foundation for quite a few years, and uh, have been interacting with uh, Commander Ranab Das for a few years as well. And I I mean over the period of time, I realized that the underwater domain awareness and skilling in that is very very important and was as much a skill of tomorrow as uh, the mentioned the things I mentioned earlier, that is mechatronics and robotics and so on. And what really uh, kind of, uh, you know, brought it to my fore was that not many or hardly any uh, work is being done in this country on underwater skills. So that was the third vertical we started, uh, we, we thought of starting. This is the first webinar, uh, you know, as a joint venture and where MRC and Indo-Swiss Center are doing this together. Very soon we'll be signing up, uh, you know, formal MOU in order to start the skilling of people at our center in Koregaon Bhima, which is about uh, 20 kilometers from Pune, uh, in the heart of the industrial belt. This uh, center has been more or less 50%, uh, you know, sponsored by the Malhotra Wakefield Foundation, my family foundation, and the other 50% is coming from Swiss and Indian companies who are interested in promoting uh, the, uh, you know, skilling of our, our people in this country uh, on the skills of tomorrow. And that's where we are. So that is how this, this collaboration has come about. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't think that since I'm speaking to people uh, who are so well adept and well versed with these issues, uh, what I'm going to say makes any sense, but I'm going to say it all the same because Arnab has insisted that I, I talk a little bit about what I feel as far as the underwater domain awareness is concerned. The coastal and waterfront security is a critical strategic aspect given the volatile security scenario in the Indo-Pacific region. I don't think I need to elaborate much on that. The asymmetry enjoyed by non-state actors makes it extremely difficult for the security forces to manage the challenges using our normal conventional means. And the waterfronts present very unique security challenges and need to be addressed, of course, in a highly nuanced manner. The lack of capacity and capability and most important, the dependence on foreign countries for critical requirements in underwater domain studies and research and skills 
is a i think to my mind a strategic failure for the country skilling in critical areas such as underwater domain should be a national priority and both the government and the corporate sector needs to shoulder this responsibility to the extent possible i believe that for fully exploiting the positive demographic deep dividend we need to have a strong focus on skilling and knowledge building especially for the skills of the future further building the ecosystem to attract and retain talent and for skilled people to be directly absorbed by the stakeholders both private and public is extremely important the more one thinks and studies the issues the more one realizes that skill and knowledge under the uda framework are multidisciplinary and have cross cutting applications in the fields of national security underwater mining biotechnology fresh water interstate and intercity mobility etc there are so many fields which are covered by this one uh, core uh, uh, study of the underwater domain the underwater domain framework is not only timely but urgently required if india has to be a global power with some standing uh, given the current situation in the indian ocean region and our critical uh, presence in that something which we cannot change and the, the 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 things that are going on over there especially with china getting more and more aggressive and assertive i think it's very important that we we develop the underwater domain awareness we develop the skills to to maintain that and to do research in that and as such we can also you know utilize the demographic advantage that we have in meaningful and proper engagement india's blue water economic potential i think needs to be also brought to the fore Our, we have such a huge economic exclusive zone which we ought to be able to you know uh, exploit to the extent that we need to and we also need to look after the security because just as the coastline uh, presents the opportunity it also has a threat of being very very vulnerable to foreign uh, you know intervention and foreign uh, i mean uh, what do you call it insertion of people into our into our country i think uh, that covers what i would like to say about this and why we are involved in this particular venture and i wish this webinar and the deliberations of today all success and i thank all of you gentlemen general saab admiral saab ajit all of you for having come here and all the people who are there on online for spending your time on this very important subject thank you very much jai hind thank you so much sir <clears throat> it was certainly a very good start and a good way to uh, uh, mrc would be very very grateful to uh, the entire industry center of excellence for coming forward to support i think it's an excellent model for industry academia user partnership and uh, the way the whole structure has evolved uh, i think we have discussed for more than 2 years and come up to a certain level and the kind of connect that it brings particularly that you can see from the distinguished panel that we have today uh, it connects the entire spectrum of uh, uh, individuals or entities that can come together to make it happen uh, now i would as we progress in this uh, partnership uh, we have been very fortunate that we have built a, a committee and uh, the committee will be chaired by none other than uh, general shekatkar sir uh, general shekatkar sir needs no introduction uh, he is the chairman of the shekatkar committee a very very important committee which has recommended or which was tasked to look at the complete restructuring of the armed forces the changing scenario in the entire region uh, uh, demands that there is a new look and uh, this is i think one of the unique committees where the recommendations uh, have been accepted by the government and already the implementation has started i think the sir will be uh, in a better position to talk about it more and we are extremely grateful to sir for having accepted i mean he has been a mentor to mrc for a long time now but uh, uh, we are extremely grateful that sir has accepted to chair this uh, committee and to take it forward uh, and i don't think anybody could have been a better person to at this thank you so much sir and i request you to kindly uh, good evening to you all gentlemen those who are present in this board meeting and those whom we can only hear maybe sometime we can see them but we are grateful to you 
for sparing your time and for decision of yours to support us, to help us, to guide us, and to coach us. The aspect of maritime security needs no elaboration. As Commander Das just mentioned, the committee of experts of which I had the honor to be chairman, we have got two chapters totally on this issue. Not only the naval aspect, but the maritime aspect, the transportation aspect, the land aspect, the water below surface, right to the sea depth, all these we have taken into account. Some have been prepped, classified deliberately for some good reasons and did not come into the public domain, but the government is aware of all these issues. What is happening today will be presumptuous on my part to explain to this wonderful audience and the participants who are there today. Almost 68% of the world today is depending on the sea coast. 68%. And there are 47 countries who are facing a conflict situation because they happen to be on seashore or they happen to be in a position to dominate the sea passage when it is passing through there. Take Russia, Ukraine, take Armenia, Azerbaijan, you take Mediterranean Sea, you take anything. And Indian Ocean is becoming a big hub. So much so that China has now started creating artificial islands that prove the point that the depth of water is not much in that places. Otherwise, it is not easy to construct a create an artificial island in that part. That also proves the time point that if we don't concentrate on these issues, probably after another 5, 7, 10, 20 years, we will run out of the resources which are on the earth space. We can't go to space and therefore the thrust will have to be on the underwater sea domain. That might just take us into a conflict zone. After all, why does want, why does Russia want to control the sea coastal belt of Ukraine? They are not interested in going up to Kiev and beyond. There are General Shogin Chavan, everybody is here, they will know it better. Why there is a war between Crimea and Azerbaijan? Why Turkey is interested? Why Caspian Sea, Black Sea have become important? I can tell you from my own personal experience how little knowledge we have. When I was in army headquarters, working in the Department of Military Affairs, Military Operations, we had to extricate our Indian peacekeeping contingent from Somalia. Because, as usual, the Americans, they bolted off without telling anybody at night because they lost five their troops and did not tell anybody. And in the morning, our commander there got to know that the Americans have left. Now, our problem was the next commander of that peacekeeping was supposed to be a Pakistani officer. And we had a problem that how can you keep not, we are not bothered about these things, but the nation may not like it. The Indian forces to be working under a Pakistani general. So we had to bring them back immediately. And we sent number of merchant, ship, merchant ships as we have the naval ships. There was a ship known as INS Amba. To our horror, we found when the ship went to Kismayu, the port, they found that they cannot dock there. The depth of water was not known. And therefore, the ship had to go all the way to Mombasa. And then we had to fly our troops there. Today, I don't know how much knowledge has increased in the world as far as the importance of sea, the seashores, the underwater depth. And that is why we are thinking that we must take the initiative and we are grateful to Mr. Malhotra to help us. The second part is, which I would request your kind consideration. He was telling me that if you have to construct a water pipeline or a gas pipeline, or a petroleum pipeline, the welding requirement of that pipeline under the sea are totally different. And those who have that 
they are charging almost $2,000 per day. That is the rate we have to pay. Just five days back, there was a leak of the gas pipeline in Europe. And the, nobody knew from where it is coming. Now, these are the problems we'll be facing. And therefore, very rightly, Mr. Mahotra decided to advance the skill development of these people who are working there. You don't require an MBA, you don't require a mechanical engineer to work as a welder at the depth of 200 feet or 400 feet. Today, the internet cables are moving around. Just last year, just last year, in the African, West African coast, 11 countries were without communication because somebody deliberately disrupted the communication system. These are the issues we have to now take in. And with your advice, with your support, with your guidance, we hope that we'll put our young generation on the right line and be used to, because they are the only nation in the world who has such a large economic zone. We are the only nation in the world which is linking with Mediterranean, which is linking with Pacific. And no wonder the Americans have very rightly decided to call Indo-Pacific region, extending right up to Australia. Now, these are the writings on the wall and we have to see. So therefore, once again, I thank you for being with us and we request your support. We request your guidance. We request your intervention to see that we don't take a wrong route because if we are not on the right route, we will end up at wrong place. So I am grateful to you and I request you to be with us and help us. Thank you very much. All the best. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. <clears throat> it indeed gives us a lot of encouragement and uh, something coming from you who have been at the very top level of decision making in the security <clears throat> domain in the country. Uh, definitely your words are extremely encouraging and you being part of this whole initiative is a very, very important thing for us. Moving on, uh, I would like to uh, give you a broad perspective on what this UDA framework is all about. Uh, today, although we are focusing on the internal and coastal security, uh, but many aspects remain valid, the importance of capacity building. I mean, I would like to take the aspect of skilling little beyond the, uh, I mean, to call it a capacity building uh, initiative, because it doesn't stop at just the skilling part. And the larger UDA framework is extremely important. And I think when I initially started off uh, some seven, eight years back and started talking to people on the UDA, everybody thought it is just a domain relevant to the Navy and not relevant to anybody else. So I was even told that, why don't you just talk to Navy? But uh, I would like to convince all of you that there is much more than uh, the security. And because as a democracy, I don't think we can afford to have a completely security driven framework. And uh, that will limit, one is uh, the resources that are available as a nation, and that will also limit the focus of the entire government. So going forward, so just to give you a broad geostrategic context, India in the 21st century, what this UDA is about and what the MRC effort is and how we could take it forward. Now, if you look at this map, the entire geopolitical or geostrategic interactions have now got limited to the tropical waters. You can see the tropical waters very clearly. There was an era in the last century where the interactions were happening in the temperate waters. It was largely the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap. But today, the entire interaction has come to the tropical waters. And as uh, General Sir also said, the Indo-Pacific region. So it is very important when we have to participate in this new strategic formulation or the new global era, we should know what we are getting into. And this tropical aspect somehow gets missed out in multiple aspects. I mean, whether it is a policy intervention or technology intervention or even capacity building. And that's where this contribution becomes extremely important. And the tropical waters are extremely unique, both in terms of political and economic. And of course, the military intervention follows these aspects. The tropical waters are known for having high biodiversity or higher resources. 
So the economic op opportunities are no less. I mean, I think the Prime Minister's Sagar declaration or the Sagar vision aptly brings it out, the security and growth. I mean, as he himself elaborated in the Sangrila dialogue in 2018, he talked about four main components of the Sagar vision. One is he recognizes the security scenario or security vulnerability in the region. Second, it recognizes or it acknowledges the economic opportunities in the region. The third is he also mentioned the rich maritime heritage we had and we need to revive that. And the fourth most important is that now India is not looking at it as a nation. We want to be a regional power. I mean, this is the first time at the apex level we had a foreign policy declaration where we considered ourselves to be a regional power. So these are very important. And today, I mean, when we discussed uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Malhotra also that this is not going to be a center just for our national requirement. It has to be of global standard. And this has to be, and uh, General Sir also in his first meeting uh, very clearly brought this out that our focus has to be in a larger regional context, not uh, limited to the national requirement. Now, if you look at the whole definition of the Indo-Pacific uh, Pacific strategic space itself, it is a tropical, by definition, it is the tropical waters of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. Now, I want to bring your uh, uh, attention to a very important point. I mean, uh, Admiral Sir is also here. The difference in the sonar performance when we accepted sonars in the uh, 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 temperate region, a sonar gives you 32 nautical miles range there. When the sonar comes to our waters in the tropical region, the degradation of performance is up to 6 nautical miles. This is about 60 to 70 percent degradation. Now, strategically, what it translates to is the asset deployment is going to be six times or seven times. Now, what it means is that even your, I mean, when we learn things, we also under, try and understand the deployment pattern. Now, what kind of deployment pattern can you think of when the performance itself is so much different? So, it has to be now, it requires an understanding. I mean, I have met a lot of my friends uh, uh, in the conservation, uh, I mean, in marine conservation community or various people working in uh, marine mammals, they have been buying or importing equipments and deploying it here. Unless you understand the acoustics of the region, I don't think you can even understand what results are you getting. And if you are not getting the right inputs to your uh, system, your outputs are going to be uh, very much biased. Going forward, I want to now bring your focus to the internal security aspect. Now, again, this is a very important, I mean, when we talk about the Brahmaputra, it's a transboundary river. And when we talk about the internal security, I mean, I want to shift attention to the freshwater systems or the inland. Now, you look at the whole Brahmaputra, there are four countries which are involved. Right from Tibet, which is also another form of China, India, Bhutan, although the river doesn't pass through Bhutan, but the Brahmaputra basin is very much relevant to and anything that happens to the basin, I mean, we never can talk about a river without the basin. So, Bhutan is equally more important and now Government of India is doing a lot of uh, <coughs> talking and a lot of uh, pl plans are there to even build dams in Bhutan. And then, of course, Bangladesh. Now, there are a whole lot of issues of upper riparian, lower riparian, being a middle riparian. We have to balance the whole geopolitics of the region and then this becomes a very important component of internal security. Now, Indian Navy or the Coast Guard is responsible for security in the oceans. Do we have somebody to look after this? So, I think it is a very important point we need to highlight. Next, please. Now, I would like you all to pay, pay attention to the present scenario. This is the Brahmaputra River passing through. So, you can see that China has already built these kind of 100, uh, 1,267 kilometer of tunnels to divert water from here because the north of China is extremely water starved. You can see they have built 1,156 kilometer of tunnels to shift water from there. And these are the planned routes, which is from the Brahmaputra. Now, I want to draw your attention when you want to do something. I mean, General Sir also talked about the mischief that China can do. But they have very good reason to do that because the north is water starved. They need it there. And the second thing I, why I'm talking about this is they have the wherewithal. They have the technology. 
they have the ability they have the resources they can easily do this even when the northeast certain programs were planned and they were uh, the asian development bank initially did not approve the loan for india under pressure from china so i mean geopolitics can be played at a multiple levels and one has to understand and that's the reason even in our skilling center we are looking at the geopolitical aspect also and we have a very senior diplomat also who's going to be part of this whole committee that's very important that we understand all this whenever we are trying to discuss at international forums these aspects have to be known so china has the reason they have the wherewithal to do whatever it has to be done and if you look at it when the water enters india it is not the water in the monsoon it is the water in the dry season which is going to make a difference the there is a place in guwahati called pandu in the monsoon season the water level is about 500 bcm but in the dry season it comes down to 70 and that is the minimum if it that gets reduced now we are looking at the inland water transport as a huge project it's a 10 lakh crore allocation that we are talking about if there is no water what are we talking about and there is a huge op- uh, possibility of mischief being done and even the impact of climate change i mean we can we are increasingly seeing a lot of uh, aspect we at mrc we have done several projects to look at multiple aspects and we get mul- multidisciplinary students right from technology to geopolitics to economics and everybody all kinds of students have been doing work and this is an ongoing work i mean we i mean i come from assam i come from brahmaputra region so i definitely i mean now you look at brahmaputra is so much integral part of the northeast or i would say assamese culture now unless we re- recognize this i mean becoming part of the culture means it has actually been connected to the whole socio economic and socio uh, cultural dimension for a very very long time i mean when hazarika has written so many songs on this so even we are looking at that dimension we have had two young students who have looked at the socio cultural dimension also we would like to share that with uh, everybody at some uh, opportune time now <clears throat> again this becomes a very important part i mean when we talk about people economy nature now when i say underwater domain awareness it is not about just looking at the security perspective how can we help the communities if you look at it the coastal communities or the riverine communities do not get help even from the financial institutions because their practices have significant amount of uncertainty now this uda can definitely bring a lot of transparency and a lot of certainty to their practices which can really help the people it can help the economy and also make it sustainable so we are definitely looking at all these verticals collectively and also individually now india in the 21st century i think firstly geopolitically geoeconomically we are looking at a very different india now i have talked about the sagar vision now to support the sagar vision there have been multiple mega projects i mean these are projects of very high dimension sagar mala i think allocation is 6 lakh crores inland water transport is more than 10 lakh crores and it's an ongoing project we are looking at 20000 kilometers of waterways 116 national waterways the first is ganga 1600 kilometers from banaras to haldia the second is brahmaputra sadia to dhubri 900 kilometers the first one is probably 40% done and Brahma, uh, national waterway number 2 has just started but we have been too much fascinated by the western know how the second nordic summit has been held in belgium uh, uh, copenhagen this year but my question is do the nordic countries understand the requirements that we have in the tropical waters they have significant heavy engineering that is available they are too happy to sell their heavy engineering dredgers are there they have been selling a lot of dredging equipment but is dredging the only solution for sediment management is the question we need to look at what is it that we can do to make sure unless we understand the sediment transport pattern i can't name an organization but there have been multiple mega projects in this country which have become economically unviable because they have relied heavily on dredging 
I don't think there was the kind of dredging that, I mean, we are not the country, we have a 5,000 or 10,000 year old civilization. There are many other methods. People have understood the sediment transport pattern and they've found ways. So we have to do that kind of research and make sure that we are able to now act as policy. I talked about the Northeast. There's a lot of focus in the Northeast, but I must bring to your notice the average width of the Brahmaputra is eight kilometers. Many people don't know this. Average width of Brahmaputra is eight kilometers. So anybody who has not understood Brahmaputra cannot think of a policy intervention or a technology intervention in the Brahmaputra. But the width, uh, the depth is very shallow. Now this inland water transport, there have been multiple accidents. They have bought barges, they have bought all kinds of uh, ships from somewhere else and it doesn't suit our requirement. So that is something we need to look at and when we say e act is policy, the same kind of conditions exist in the entire South Asia. So if we develop these capabilities, I don't think in today's world anybody can stop us from exporting this or being a true leader. I mean the true realization of the Sagar vision can happen with policies or with skilling or capacity building which suits these conditions. And you can see the entire uh, tropical region. And of course, Northeast is a major development uh, trust because we've had internal security issues, challenges. So I'm addressing the security through a community led or economy, uh, economic activities led initiative. Unless we bring more certainty, we will be able to, not, will not be able to look at that. So socio-economic, socio-cultural focus is very, very important. And of course, it will only be possible with capacity and capability building. Now, a very interesting thing is inland water transport is a very, very important project. Nobody can question that. But Northeast or the Brahmaputra is also known for the freshwater dolphin. And in 2009, it has been declared, I mean, freshwater dolphin has been declared as a national marine mammal, a national ma mammal. Now, the census of dolphins in Brahmaputra in two, uh, 1995 was 3000. In 2005 was 300 and and crores of money has been spent on the dolphin conservation. Now I want to tell you that these dolphins are blind. These are known facts, not that I am trying to say nothing new that I am saying. And if you can see the snot, this is a sonar that they use. To give you a more easy example is in any press conference, you see the long mics which are used. That is to filter the noise around. So this basically that's a sonar that processes sound, it focuses because then they can conserve the energy. And they are blind because they live in muddy water, they can't see. So they use what is called acoustic vision. Now you know speed of sound in water is five times in air, uh, compared to air. So only signal that propagates underwater is sonar and that's why we talk about sonar. Now if we do not use the acoustic component for conservation and if you do not understand that so the uh, the ships or the barges or the smaller crafts that are going to be used for inland water transport is going to cause massive amount of acoustic habitat degradation so unless we understand that how do we even make it a sustainable development goal next please now the other bigger problem is water resource management today in india we are 20 percent water short Northeast is the only place which is surplus, you can see. Now, even the industrial development, now this whole uh, semiconductor movement, people are, uh, a lot of Taiwanese companies are trying to come in and they are also being excited. Even the Japanese prime minister was supposed to come and set up things. But if you look at the rest of the country, there's huge. Now, giving the example of Kharakwasla, Kharakwasla is 50% silted. We did an experiment in 2017. This is soft silt. Now, people say this is very good for farming. Now, if it is good for farming, in India, the per average size of a farm is two acres. Who is going to, can the uh, farmer afford to carry this? And Khadakwasla is 500 square kilometers and uh, uh, silt is soft silt. Right from what dredging method to use? You have to have underwater domain awareness. Dredging doesn't work in soft silt. It doesn't work. So people are people have got dredging contracts on this. 
So we need to understand this and uh, I mean unless we do acoustic survey, acoustic survey will give you the complete understanding of, I mean we have done it in Kharakwasla, so we know 3 to 4 meters is soft silt. And bigger challenge here is the sediment disposal. Where will you dump it? And between the Rabi and the Kharif it is only one month. Can you remove it in one month? And we are a developing nation. I mean, I think the builders lobby, it will be a delight. You can make, put a brick making machine on the, uh, have a hydraulic suction, put a brick making plant, 20,000 bricks. They, these are available. I mean, this is what we should tell the Nordic country to give us. They have these plants. I mean, they give you what they have, not what you want. So, I mean, this is a win-win. I mean, the government cannot, doesn't need to spend money. They can actually earn money because it belongs to the government. Next, please. Water quality management. The chemical and biological contamination across the country, you can see. Northeast is more biological uh, contamination, but uh, no, uh, North, it is well known. I think post the <coughs> Green Revolution, the entire place is, the chemical contamination is extremely high. And now the coastal uh, regions are facing a massive saline contamination. So unless we have a mechanism to have water quality management, I, today in today's world, we should be getting a real-time appreciation of what water is coming to us. In Singapore, when I was there, our lab had built, they, they built uh, robots for various applications. Then they thought, how do we find more applications? So the water quality management, they have separate lakes for domestic purposes. So they put these small swans. I mean, the belly had a robot. So the swan could keep going around, uh, uh, moving around. And they have a real-time appreciation. The, the belly had sensors which had 28 parameters being measured at the same time. And that is uploaded into our server. And that these are very simple systems which are available, just that it has to be implemented. And this can be, although, although our pollution control board has this as a mandate, it has been implemented for air but not been done for water. Next, please. So these are certain skills which we need to tell people. And this is a huge opportunity. This entire thing can be given as a uh, uh, service. So now looking at the larger maritime domain awareness or more specifically the underwater domain awareness, there are four stakeholders. And this maritime domain awareness term actually became very, very critical after the 9-11 incident and the 26-11. So because of that, it remained a security driven formulation with very, I mean, we know the security community always is very anxious about the data security part. But I think the financial world has learned many ways where the access is also given and plus the security or the privacy of the data is equally ensured. So I think today there are modern ways where that can be taken care. But can the security budget of the country in a democracy like us manage the entire capacity building that is required? Next, please. So, <clears throat> next. So just to give you a sense of the four stakeholders, now, the underwater threat has become a very real threat. I mean, even young kids from colleges are making underwater drones. When I was in Singapore in 2015, we had the Singapore AUV competition. There were young students from colleges from Thailand, China, Russia, Malaysia, who came with fantastic designs of underwater drones. And just imagine this going into wrong hands. So we have to have a way I mean, the way you talk about cyber security, you can't counter it. You have to overwhelm them. So similar thing we have to also look at. I mean, this has to be a component of every activity. And underwater ro uh, 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 robotics is definitely a more specialized thing. You have to understand, have a sense of acoustics. Next. Blue economy, I mean, a very simple thing. Oil, everybody understands. But even we are increasingly looking at the uh, C for food security. A 1996 report, Colorado University report says there are the fish stock globally is on the decline. But the bycatch today with this mechanized trawling, we, uh, we pick up almost 100 tons of fish in one go. 80% is thrown back into the sea. So that's called the bycatch. So on one end, we have the stock is uh, depleting, but the bycatch is 80%. How do you rationalize this? I mean, because the entire fishing is in the unorganized sector. So uh, regulating this also. So again, underwater domain, I'm, traditionally we had this thing of we don't fish during the breeding season and all that. But that is also not followed by these trolls. So how will you regulate this? 
There's a lot of technology that is available, but it has to be done in a more practical way. So again, I mean, deep sea mining, now there is tremendous opportunity. Government has allocated 4,000 4, crores. That itself requires, I mean, we have signed an MOU with the Ministry of Earth Sciences. They want to scale up the entire capacity building for deep sea mining, all kinds of things. We, we just need to present ourselves as a viable uh, 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 entity which can do this and this is a huge requirement and there is huge amount of allocation for capacity building also there. Next please. Now, I mean the northeast or the riverine system, I mean we talked about the, <coughs> you can see people are trying to do dredging but it's just not viable. I mean particularly when you talk about the Brahmaputra, how can you dredge? How will you bear the cost? It's just not possible and that's what they have realized now. And they don't even have, uh, I mean, today you can generate heat maps to understand the sediment pattern. And if that gets into the digital format, entire policy beca making becomes easier. Otherwise, we are now playing blind. I mean, in every way, we have no idea how it is going to pan out. Fisheries, I mean, there are places in India, both in the freshwater and the marine system, where either fish is dying of old age or there is overfishing. How do you regulate this? How will you manage this as an industry is something very serious and we, uh, we need to do something and it's possible. Next please. Now, environment and disaster management. I mean, if you look at yesterday, I was in a conference, national conference on SDGs. If you look at all the 17 SDG, I said it with a lot of conviction that all the 17 SDGs can be addressed by UDA. Whether it is poverty elevation, whether it is hunger or you can name it and I am coming out with a very detailed paper end of this month. But every, I mean, SDG 14 is life below water. But there is water and sanitation number 7. I can assure you every SDG can be addressed by underwater domain awareness. And you can see disaster management, I mean, there is so much. I'm not here to say that we can prevent a disaster, but definitely we can minimize the loss of life and property. The entire disaster warning system can be really kind of galvanized. Next, please. And again, I talked about underwater noise, inland water transport. There are a whole lot of issues, both in the internal security dimension. I mean, these kind of devastations will only cause more frustration among the communities and will actually take them away from us. Next, please. And of course, how do you bring more and more science and technology into this domain? People talk about data science, but everybody knows data science cannot happen without the domain understanding. I mean, a data scientist alone cannot do artificial intelligence. How, what, on what domain will he? So domain understanding is equally important and it has to be a collective effort. I mean, these were some of the research cruises I did uh, when I was in Tokyo. They have a seamless system where Jamstack maintains the ship, Tokyo University controls all the uh, research cruises that will happen and they manage it. So we have to have a system in India where we have such a young population. How do they, I mean, yesterday I asked the question to the youngsters that how many of you do projects which have got a real life or real world problem solving uh, application? So we have to get this. We are happy to say that we've had more than 100 IIT kids in the last two years who have done real world problem solving and more than 200 students from other colleges. Next please. This is the framework where I would like to spend a little time. If you look at the four sides of the cube, they represent the four stakeholders, whether it is blue economy, security, environment and disaster management and research and innovation of science and technology. All of them may have their own requirements, specific requirements, but the core is the acoustic capacity and capability building. Unless our sonar gives us the right performance, nobody benefits. Now, when we want to detect a submarine or we want to detect any uh, kind of intrusion through our coastal thing, unless we get, can the defense budget spend enough money to create that capacity? I don't think so. So the capacity building has to be a collective effort. All of, if all the four stakeholders put in if there is a pooling of resources and synergizing of effort, it automatically serves this. The second thing I want to bring to your notice is 
it has to be multidisciplinary. That's the biggest challenge we have this in this country. If you look at it, the vertical construct, we have very little understanding of our own uh, underwater scenario or even for that matter, many various other aspects. We don't know what the ecosystem is, what are the various components of the ecosystem, how they interact with each other. How will you navigate sustainability if you do not know what the ecosystem exists? And we have not invested in field work. So if we do not, so we have to have a lot of sensing, application specific, and are even the policies are actually drawn from somewhere else. If you do not, it has to be a bottom up approach. Unless it is a bottom up approach, I don't think we will be able to do justice. So, and if you look at these smaller cubes, these are the projects which our young students can do, which will have a real world application. Even the government, when it is allocating resources, whether it is research fund or any other infrastructure, this can act, there are so many components in the maritime ecosystem which are not regulated and some of them are over regulated. So this can actually give you a structured approach where you can actually allocate uh, policy priority to various sectors or various issues and you can actually cover the entire gamut of what is required. So I think this can be and even the same thing now we can export whether it is killing whether it is even we can look at the regional framework unless we are able to address this and when we want to be a leader in the region it is only our capacity and capability building which can make us a leader otherwise we will always be dependent i mean we can't be dependent on somebody else to help our neighbors i mean we have a neighborhood policy but unless we have our own homegrown capacity which is suited i mean i clearly told you that the the know-how that exists with the west does not suit our requirement and we are still trying to import it from there and then trying to pass it on to our neighbors. It won't work. Next, please. Just to extend the same larger UDA framework to a very specific thing of underwater noise. Now, underwater noise is very important for the Navy because stealth is a very important thing. I mean, the ships have to or submarines have to be quiet. But the same quiet technology or the stealth technology is important for the marine mammals. Now, the International Maritime Organization has taken this very seriously. Our ships have to be quiet. I mean, noise pollution has become a very, very important thing. In fact, we are very happy to tell you that in 2019, uh, 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 sorry, 21, our paper was sent by the government of India as a, India's paper to the IMO on underwater noise. Now, based on that paper, now IMO has come back because our thing was very specific about the tropical conditions. And based on that paper, now IMO has asked India to be a lead nation in the Indian Ocean region. And now, hopefully, we get up. So we've been asked to give all the details. So hopefully, we'll get an opportunity. There is a fund allocation also from them. But uh, I think government of India also can become a leader in this whole region. And I want to give you a very funny but very important example. When you buy a vehicle, the vehicle has to get a PUC. And the same thing, the MSDF, Marine Strategic Framework document of the EU, has also come up with. So a ship also has to get a PUC document. Now, look at the business model. I mean, we are in a chamber. The business model is if you are to get a PUC for your car or a uh, scooter or a two-wheeler, you have to pay some 200, 300 rupees. Let me say 100 rupees. How many cars come on the road or how many vehicles come on the road on a daily basis? And how many ships, at least a lakh ships enter our waters in a monthly basis? Minimum, I'm giving a very, just multiply that. I can give you a figure. We did a project proposal. For a merchant ship, it is 5 lakhs. Okay. And if you, for the few, sign pollution. Sign pollution check. For Navy, it is very important. So I've done some calculation. I'll not give you that number. But easily, 5 lakhs can be charged. Out of that 5 lakh, government of India can take 1 lakh rupees to excite the regulator to get into this. And the policy also will be made by us and we'll say every one year you do this. A ship, there's a periodicity you have to define. Just look at the number that exists. So I gave this idea to even Sri Lanka because they are next to the slock. If you come up with this and you do this, the cost is not more than 50,000 per ship. And when it's scaled up, it can even come down. It's huge, you know, it's not, it's much more than that. It's much, much more. You can't even imagine. Next, please. Sediment management. Again, 
you can imagine Jane PT spends 150 crores annually on dredging. If your sediment transport study can bring it down by 50, 000 cro uh, 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 50 crores just for one port. So there are not only that, water resource management, inland water transport, so many stakeholders will require the same technology or the same skilling set. And look at the number of people who will require this skill. It's unimaginable. And same thing, as you said, sir, we are importing this from outside. And we are doing no analysis. It is just that software which has been designed by them and what is being given to us. Next, please. And for all our data to the rest of the world, you know, we should be maintaining our data with us. I'm, why should China be able to know which what our river system? Uh, I can't name the organization, sir. There are very strategic security organization where they are using foreign software and they say it's a black box. And they take this outside to do the analysis. Not acceptable. So now coming to a user academy industry partnership today to drive this, I, I want to request even Mr. Prashant also to drive this. You need nothing. There are schemes available. Okay, so there are schemes available. Make in India, Skill India, Startup India, Digital India. There are schemes available with allocation of funds. Skilling India is three lakh crore budget. They're not able to spend the money. Then individual projects, Sagar Mala has got 6 lakh crore. In that, there is a separate component of capacity building. Inland water transport is 10 lakh crore. There is a separate component in that. I mean, Scale India is generic. So we are going to come to uh, the chamber for setting up a sector skill council on the underwater itself because it is cross-cutting. We need, we need the chamber's uh, sort of packing. Work will all be done by ISCAP and MRP. But it will have to be presented from the chamber because, you know, it has to come from a credible organization. I don't see much problem in that. We will work together to do this. I assured uh, Arnab that, uh, you know, chamber will have no problem in at least fronting the thing for us. We had a MOU. We have an MOU with the Sector Skill Council on Strategic Manufacturing uh, and Capital Goods. But we realized that we are missing out on various other sectors. Uh, there are 35 sector skill councils. There are so many others that are missing out. And this has to have a focus on the underwater component. You have done our uh, sensitization at the central level. Then in Delhi, the governing body of the strategic manufacturing sector skill council. Now, which is being merged with the capital goods sector. Right. So it's a huge thing. So all the different products, NDPSUs and the OMPs, everything is under the strategic right. manufacturing sector. And it's being merged with the capital goods. Right. So all the LNDs of the world and everything is coming under that one big umbrella. We had an MOU signed with them. We've already sensitized them. But uh, what we need is being out of Pune, we need some local support and if the chamber and the industry uh, center of excellence can do it. So we've done that and uh, this end needs to be done. And it can be a real uh, massive uh, now, even the second thing that we have done, sir, is also we uh, we reached out to the Niti Aayog to say that there is a national policy required on capacity and capability building. Niti Aayog was very kind. The vice chairman, the CEO, and four advisors spent a lot of time with us, and then they gave us a project to make a report, which I also discussed with sir. And now that report is a report commissioned by them, and that is now being circulated. And based on that, we also signed an MOU with the. Uh, Minister of uh, Earth Sciences and that has also been said. So even that is a document which is available which can back our case or you know kind of justify a case. So we have these capabilities which are required. So if we can just put this together in the funnel we get the right kind of policy intervention, technology intervention and capacity building. We are tying up with various academic institution, various I mean now IIT, Terry, uh, even some IIMs are also there even Monash University is sending uh, a lot of their students. Uh, Sri Lanka, multiple their Kotabala uh, Defense University is sending students. We would also like your students to join us. And a whole lot of people can work with us. It is a multidisciplinary program. Uh, uh, JNU's uh, School of In uh, International Studies also has shown interest. And many uh, young st uh, kid, uh, students are joining us directly also. But we would like an institutional relation because then is if it is part of their degree curriculum, then the uh, institution also should be involved. And you can see the various stakeholders who will benefit out of this and or who can participate in this. Next, please. 
so the riverine communities i mean the, there is a huge population i mean rivers always have been the hubs of civilization so unless we can bring lot of transparency to this whole process the governance mechanism will become uh, much more stronger and uh, i think with this and the traditional knowledge is extremely important i mean so we have actually been focusing on archaeology also and how to i mean science and technology should be an enabler for mapping the traditional knowledge to the modern requirement i mean the scaling up should be done using technology not to replace the traditional knowledge and that's why our effort and as i said we've done a lot of work on the archaeology part of it i mean we, uh, my first fellow was on uh, underwater archaeology because even the regulation people are not aware now if you go and remove an artifact i mean that's what people have done i can't name the organization people in their in initial enthusiasm went and removed the artifacts now you destroyed the whole thing so there has to be a proper regulation to even encourage i mean the government has to step in so there is a lot of things that are required i mean the archaeological survey of india does not have the wherewithal for underwater archaeology but nio thought that they can do it but then it got into a little difficulty so i i see a lot of opportunity for us even to drive that aspect next please so you can see i mean when i say tropical water this is just to elaborate in different Uh, seasons you can see how much the underwater conditions vary and that's why the digital transformation is extremely important i mean unless we have this in, uh, input of digital transformation we will not be able to get the real time impact uh, i mean that real time uniqueness has to be captured and when we want to deploy something or we want to do any intervention that has to be kind of kept in mind next please so same thing i mean it translates to the sofar depth which determines the performance of the sonar so we have done a lot of mapping and lot of uh, such things next please even in the three dimensional thing also i mean this is our unique contribution in the tropical waters i mean globally this nobody else has done i mean even uh, from a scientific perspective also this is our unique contribution next please so we have certain recognition we got uh, won the no uh, narwal challenge in 2019 we were the only team from asia on uh, on the maritime innovation then also we developed the same thing we uh, translated into a submarine deployment tool or a underwater passive sonar deployment tool that also won a global innovation challenge in 2021 we have more than uh, 50 innovative ideas which can now go into the startup ecosystem so an incubation center is also one of our plans which in a very mature state now as i said we have more than uh, 100 uh, iit students and more than 200 bits plani students these are top students who have come and work with us now there is a group in us which wants to put up a accelerator here so we said we can do it in a slightly different manner because our incubation center will be also the idea given by us it's not that we are going to incubate somebody else's idea and we can provide that ecosystem to kind of drive this niti ayog as i mentioned the thing our paper has gone to the mepc 76 now it has gone a step further to get recognition from there and now india is going to be a lead nation so we are very happy to contribute to that and of course uh, thanks to general shekhar ka sir we have also submitted a for specifically for security and both this aspect of internal and coastal security uh, uh, the nsa's office has accepted our paper and we are already in a very advanced stage of dialogue next our Uh, academic programs 10 of them have been approved by the aict so when we talk about skilling we already have the approvals from the authorities uh, our programs have been approved under the pradhan mantri kaushal vikas yojana also so they are ready now it doesn't have to even go for the regulatory approval and more modules and even when we give the skilling uh, certificates we can also have a aict uh, kind of recognition because that also is there so it is in a much much advanced stage and i found that instead of co collaborating with an academic institution i think having our own center which can provide and now the new nep allows this earlier it was not possible now both your academic and skilling can come together so that's a very big advantage we have see what we are going to do at the absolute center yes actually teaching people so we have basically next please now just to give you one example of cross cutting application now shrimp uh, uh, snapping shrimp mapping we did because snapping shrimp is a very unique species which can swamp a submarine deployment because the sound it produces this is 200 db uh, which is uh, 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 i mean and they are in millions in a snapping shrimp bed 
but uh, a, a blue whale, which is the biggest mammal, produces 196 dB. So these are small creatures, which is of this size, and they produce 200 dB, and they are in millions in one championship bed. So they can overwhelm. Uh, uh, I mean, me and Admiral Verma sir has a paper on this that it can overwhelm a strategic submarine. Now, but we did that, and we. So I was talking to Pratap uh, Pawar sir. He said he stopped me in between and said, "What have you done for the community?" It was like a. I didn't have an answer instantly to because he had. So he then he also understood that I got stumped. So he said, "Arnab, 25 years back, I was in uh, Vietnam, and those guys were laughing at us. And my brother was the agriculture minister, so I called him up. Then uh, agriculture minister of state went there, and after that, I don't know what happened. So we, based on that, after six months, I went back to him to say that we have developed a complete technology, digital tool, to support shrimp farming. Now this gives you complete transparency in taking this forward." And this will give you, you can actually do intervention, well-informed intervention. I mean, if there is a possibility of uh, disease outbreak, you can actually predict that and do the intervention well in time. So we didn't get much support for this, but the same thing we translated to seaweed and now the Excel Enterprises has given us significant support uh, to carry on. I mean, we ha could support 30, 40 IIT students based on that support. So now they are doing uh, seaweed uh, farming in a very serious manner and they, they found this Thing very very useful. So we are now ready with the modeling and simulation, and now in the next stage, in a couple of months, we are getting into the deployment part of it. Next, please. So I mean, what I'm trying to say is that underwater domain awareness can that capacity building can go into multiple applications and across uh, different stakeholders. Oh, I think you're going back. Yeah. So this uh, just to give you a pictorial view, and the noise levels are very very high in shrimp farming. Go ahead, please. So, the, so it was very interesting when we got into the shrimp farming thing, there's an American paper, the Americans did snapping shrimp mapping of the entire world in 1946. Scripps Institute started in 1946. They took about five, six years to do this because you can imagine the level of technology. Today, everything is available commercially off the shelf, but they had to design right from, and that's I think vision when I mean, you invest like that. So when we got into this based on the certain parameters that they gave, when we did the habitat mapping, we realized there are 14 subspecies of snapping shrimps alone with very unique vocalization patterns. And they vocalize, uh, the trigger for vocalization is totally different. So we, whatever uh, we did a lot of, this was a very good project done by a girl, young girl from Bitspilani. Then we got into the soundscape mapping, how you convert this habitat mapping into soundscape mapping. And now today with AI and robot AI, this is a very, I mean, this is very easy to do if you understand what it is. So we are now ready with the prototype and it can be deployed. So that is the state we are. Next, please. And we've been doing the summer school since 2017. I've been doing it. I, in 2017, Prafulji knows I did it all by myself in Pune, in my small center, 20 kids from all over Maharashtra came. And then by the end of six weeks, I got very confident that I called the ecosystem of Pune. <laughs> a lot of people came. And then Vigyan Bharti got associated with us. And uh, by the end of it, I mean, the, the young kids came on their own. They stayed on their own. They worked on their own. And But the excitement was so high that I got very confident. And I got a lot of senior people from the Pune ecosystem. And everybody felt very happy about this. Everybody was doing a single project. And that's how we started. And then 2018, we did a, a national level thing where Vigyan Bharti helped us. The validity was done at the uh, at, uh, late Mr. Manohar Parikar's office in Goa. Pune University joined us. Two weeks, in, uh, four weeks in Pune University, two weeks in Goa. Entire logistics supported by Pune University and Goa. So it was a very different project. And uh, even, I mean, you can see Admiral Karve, the, the, even the resource persons were absolutely senior people. Uh, thanks to Jan uh, Shekhar sir was also there. Uh, <coughs> go ahead. Yeah, the next year, uh, Bombay University did it. Yeah, we did it with Bombay. So you can Bombay see. So three universities we have worked with already. So next year, uh, Vigyan Bharti said uh, uh, we'll do it Bombay and uh, uh, Goa. So it was it went out, but then in the pandemic we had to take a break. But parallelly, we also ran these uh, online. Uh, sorry, uh, we had this physical program for Bits Pilani, and so that's a different lot. I mean, they, they they were not interested in seeing places or doing other things. So they only focused on their work. 
So that way we parallelly had about 30 Bitspilani students and IIT students who worked with us. And uh, but that continued even during the pandemic online and that has online worked very well for us in the last three years. Next please. So you can see, I mean, you can see all the uh, very, I mean, Admiral Arun Prakash sir is also there, Dilip Donde is there, Director of NIO, uh, Sunil Kumar sir. And this is, I think, the highlight of that program. Uh, Mr. Pra uh, Dr. Prasanna Kumar, who was the former director of NIO, he takes them for a beach walk from morning 8 o'clock to evening 7 o'clock. Four different beaches in Goa. He's a physical oceanographer and he's accompanied by a marine biologist. So complete oceanographic thing in a practical sense and uh, also the biodiversity is given to the, the students. And it's, and it's a very good, uh, on a weekend, on a Sunday, we do this. And it's a fantastic team building thing also that happened and I think this is the highlight of this program. Chief Minister of Goa is there. Now it, after Mr. Parikar it has been, a, I mean every time even the Chief Minister has been very kind to join us. So it's been very encouraging for us. Next please. Then I mean I talked about the Kharakwasla thing. Here also a Deputy Commandant came and stood for two hours. So the whole machinery then <laughs> is very kind to you. So five days they we had, I mean, you can't imagine this getting such kind of resources. Five boats were allocated to us. Next, please. And thanks to Rajan sir. Rajan sir also came and stood. At least two days he was there for full day. You can see these kind of boats, I don't, and there are two things. Kharakwasla, actually, nobody else can put a boat. Even if you think you can hire a boat and put, you can't do that. That's not permitted. So, and NDA giving us this support free of cost, that is the lady in the middle, she is my PhD student who did work on this. She worked for two years to do the modeling of the entire Kharakwasla. And that's how we, because we had limited resources, I could only afford one. Bajaj uh, was very kind to give me uh, support. And I didn't even know how to how much to ask them. So, so they said, how much you want? So I said something very, they laughed at me that, how can you ask such a small amount? But whatever it is, this uh, thing became so good Five days we did data collection there, morning till evening under different conditions. Even that period, it was on uh, 9th of August, which was chosen because that is the day when uh, the fluctuation is maximum in the entire year. So we did that all study for two years and then we did the data. And that data has been used by many and students. The person over there is your younger brother, right? I don't have a younger brother, sir. <laughs> Looks like <laughs> 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 oh, that is me, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Next. <laughs> you know, see, Kharakwasla provides all the fresh water to Puma, drinking yeah, yeah. water, right? And the dam is 50 percent city. Yeah. So the whole of Pune is a stakeholder in. Yeah. Actually, we can get the support of the builder lobby, the the citizens of Pune, the chamber. The chamber can play a very important role in this uh, thing. And all the four dams can be done with supply water to PCNC and Pune. And it can be a huge project where the chamber can take the lead. No, and we start, we actually got the equipment. For diesel. Huh? For diesel. diesel. For diesel thing for the water. See, because uh, you know, because it's fifty percent silted, during the monsoon we have to let the water go. So it causes so, uh, flooding, flooding in the down plane. And in summer we have fifty percent less water. So it's it's a big uh, thing. And the the life of a dam is linked to the situation in the dam. And these dams are more than 100 years old. And it also has an impact on the dam safety. And the government of Maharashtra has got 3,000 crores allocated for these projects. And they don't know what to do with it. For diesel. So it's a very, uh, I mean, the chamber can play a very important role. So, I mean, I had no resources. We hired all these sonars and uh, the GM actually was surprised. What is this guy doing? He came and he didn't charge me any money. He said, sir, yeah, kya karo? So he came and spent the full day. And But we had five different sonars which we used. And this was very unique data that we got. Next, please. And we also collected sample. And you can see, sir, uh, this is the, you can't pick it from a, a, using a dredger. Even those cores could not pick it up. Next. It's too uh, soft. It won't, it is very loose. They're using buckets like this. Yeah. Pumps up. Uh, suction. Yeah. So we, uh, I would submit that it is an outreach engaged, sustain outreach is such uh, seminars and webinars. We've been doing almost one a month or maybe sometimes more on diverse aspects of the UDA. And then we engage with a particular defining certain specific aspects and then sustain it with a more concrete project or even a proper <clears throat> engagement and then uh, a center of excellence. Next. 
So, a center of excellence should have a model where, I mean, a multidisciplinary research center, incubation, scaling, and I think we have contributed to all the five verticals uh, in a very substantial way. So, now we are ready that we can actually set up a full blown center of excellence. Next. Thank you. I think. So, uh, thank you so much for the patient uh, hearing. And I think it is important for us to be able to convey the nuances of the underwater domain awareness. And uh, we would like to now request uh, Admiral Verma, sir. Admiral Verma, uh, sir, has a very unique profile apart from being a naval officer and reaching at, to the highest uh, level uh, as a chief of material in the Navy, heading the technical branch in the Navy as a PSO. Sir, later on, took over as the director general of the uh, ATB project, which is the nuclear submarine <coughs> uh, program, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, he has been part of that for a very long time. And it was under his leadership that the first uh, nuclear submarine or the strategic submarine was launched. So <clears throat> we are extremely grateful to Sir for being a advisor to the MRC. And he's been my mentor for more than 25 years, I would say. I mean, right from my days in... <laughs> so my uh, time in IIT and uh, we did a lot of project for the program and we could contribute significantly and he's been my gui uh, guide then as well. And uh, uh, I would, uh, even when I started MRC also, sir, has been uh, there with me right from the beginning. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for joining us and I would request you to kindly make your comments. Uh, thank you, Arnav. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, it's... Uh, I'm delighted actually to be here, uh, though at short notice, <laughs> to, sh to share the platform with such illustrious personalities. I met each one of you at different, I think you with PIC mostly, yeah. I met all of you and of course, General Shetka, he, he's seen everywhere, so I can't say better. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm really happy that uh, the UDA has you know, gone I have been associated, yes, since in, in uh, bits and parts, and of course, in the initial stages. But I'm glad that uh, the vision that uh, Arnav uh, brought to our notice in 2014, Sir. Uh, 2014, when we started this thing, is uh, bearing fruit. I've been asked to, you know, today, give my comments on, what's the, what's the, uh, on uh, the technology as an enabler in the strategic uh, field. Uh, well, I will be a little general generalist because I think this probably is for an audience, uh, not just people who know, but people probably who don't know. I've been asked to talk on, I mean, today's thing is on coastal and water and security. Um, but I thought that unless you know <clears throat> what's in the water, what security will you give? What is the type of security you can give? So you have to understand the medium. You have to understand the domain. So my thing today is for the layman to basically see when you say coast, what does it mean in maritime terms? Is it the coastline? So I, I thought mine should be a basic uh, thing. So please pardon, pardon me from all those experts who know everything. I'm one of those chaps who starts with not knowing anything. So I hope we lead somewhere. Okay. In the recent years, thanks largely uh, due to the consistent and efforts of the MRC and in uh, particular, Commander Das with his backup, Raful Talera. The stakeholders and policymakers, I think, have been sensitized to the to the requirement of an underwater domain awareness. And it is clear also from the presentation made by Arnab that he's met almost everybody and he's, and everybody's asked him to make some paper and he's presented those papers, etc. So that's done. But setting up a framework that will synergize the efforts across the stakeholders and implementing it on the ground requires a critical understanding of this complex domain. So I will be talking about this complex domain. The principal stakeholders identified uh, on the chart earlier were the maritime security, the blue economy, environment, disaster management, and science and technology. 
I dare say that any of them can operate independently, either in the domain or otherwise. Even the Navy would depend on the Stugs and on the coast because finally they do come to the coast. So neither the Coast Guard nor the Navy were supposed to be the maritime security personnel or uh, in, in his words, uh, providers, yeah, the maritime security providers to the UDA. We can, uh, we, we can't. So therefore, whatever I say today applies across the line, though I will be talking about uh, the uh, framework for UDA framework for cost, coastal water, uh, coastal and waterfront security. Uh, the coast and waterfront presents unique security challenges and needs to be addressed in a more nuanced manner. It cannot be just generalized. First of all, what is meant by coast and waterfront as far as the uh, maritime domain is concerned? Now, we all uh, understand what is the territorial integrity of India. When we say that, it is tied to the concept where borders define the limit of one state's territory, and beyond that commences another state. That's very simple to understand, and those who have been in the front line do understand that very well. In the case of the maritime boundaries, borders that define the limit of one state's territory, the situation is quite different. Borders that limit one state's maritime territory have waters beyond it, which may not belong to it and may not belong to anyone. Right? And definitely not another state's territory, which I will tell you why. Uh, our land border, all of us know, is approximately 16,000 kilometers. The coastline, everyone says, is only 7,500 kilometers, just half of it. Yet, this poses similar challenges from, I didn't want to say more challenges because he's sitting here, from the state and non-state actors. In the, in the maritime domain, we refer to what is called maritime zone of India, rather than just the coastline. We need to understand this. What do we what do we mean by this? The maritime zone of India comprises of waters of the territorial sea. Now that's very clear. A moment to say territorial sea, yeah, it is mine. We know that we have full sovereignty over it. It's a belt of coastal water up to 12 nautical miles from the defined baseline. Now, what's a defined baseline? Well, that's been defined uh, by the country and put across uh, because the coast is pretty ragged, so you have a here, the sovereignty over the ocean surface, underwater, including seabed and sea subsoil, and the airspace above it, that means just like land, is the complete sovereignty. The state has the right to both prevent and punish infringement of physical immigration, sanitary, and custom laws. So that is your territorial sea. 12 nautical rounds. So you can see now my border is increasing. So 7,500 means it's not 7,500. We're getting closer there. <laughs> then you have the contiguous zone, which is up to 24 nautical miles. Now that means, and it is from the baseline and not from the 12 nautical mile line. That should be done. Here, jurisdiction only over the surface underwater seabed, but not airspace. What does it mean? It means if I have an aircraft, I mean, an enemy aircraft carrier close by, his aircraft can come up to my 12 nautical mile and still he's not in my territory, right? So these are the things that we have to keep in mind. Then you have the exclusive economic zone, which has been talked about and is very important for this country because uh, what's been presented for here, because things are going to dry up in land and you're going to go there. And that's your property, and we should know how to get it and what lies there. From territorial sea, that is from the 12 nautical mile to 200 nautical mile, here what you have? You have sovereign rights for exploration and use of marine resources. So that is why your blue economy, et cetera, it exists here, and we have to claim that. And sea, of course, is international waters. So if you notice that after the 20 four mile, it becomes international waters. Even after the territorial sea is international waters, but you have jurisdiction over it. That because in case that chap comes in, you can still get him. India has also made a claim for an extended EZ and it's been awarded, where we go up to 350 nautical miles. 
Why? Because we have continental shelf in certain areas which go beyond the 200 nautical mile area. Therefore, now contiguous, contiguous maritime boundaries where they exist, if at all, separate not our respected territories, but our EZ. So EZ is, as far as I'm concerned, my coastal territory because I have rights, I have my thing. So when we talk of coast, we should be very clear that I should not be just looking for somebody here. I should be looking for him right there 200, at 300, 200. 200 or 350 nautical miles. Why? Because you've all heard long back when we were youngsters, Thailand used to fish in our waters. Today they don't come because we became aware of what is ours. So we have stopped them from doing it. So fish is uh, whatever it is, is thing. Yeah, it, 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 it's thing. So therefore, Irrespective of whether we use it or not, nobody should be doing something in my waters without my knowing and without giving me any royalty or anything like that. I can make an economic thing of it, whatever it is. Probably a lot of you know that everyone talks of the Indo Indo Pacific, but I will say Indo Pacific used to be the Indian Ocean region and then got extended to the Pacific because you brought in Australia and others, right? We have, we in the Indian Ocean region itself have 37 maritime neighbors, much more than what the land border uh, thinks. And not all of them are stable neighbors. So they are issues of security. We have 1200 of our own island territories. Uh, I don't think many people know. If you take Lakshadweep, Minikoi and all, there are 1200 islands that belong to us, right? So that's how we, I, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to that. Now, if you take all of this, and as I said, that EZ goes from thing, and you have these, say, Lakshadweep and Minikoi, they are, they, they are a thing. You can't have, what do you call that, coastal line that way. So you have a baseline. So we have covered the baseline, and everything starts from there. That's how, today, the total water area where I have jurisdiction on my economic uh, requirements are 3.1 million square kilometers. And may I just also remind the people or inform the people, the total land area which I have is just three square kilometer, uh, million square kilometers. And our water area is 3.1 square, a uh, million square so the kilometers. new amendment which has come recently. Right. So, yeah, it's basically, it's easy, right? So it's a, it's a, it's 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 there now. Yeah. In addition, uh, I think most of you would know the International Seabed Authority has allotted an area of seventy-five thousand square kilometers in the Central Indian Ocean Basin. It's not very close to us, pretty far away. Very unfair of them, but pretty far mm -hmm. away. The reason, be, but as as founder members. Right. Why I say unfair is we are founder members, but it's pretty deep, far away. So we have to sustain that that area also with us for, and what have they given it to us is for exploration, for exploration and exploiting the resources. The NIO, NIO, NIO under the Ministry of Earth Sciences has already carried out the exploration in 2014-16 and has confirmed metal resources to the tune of 100 million tons. And and very recently, I heard one of the uh, ministers I don't know who said we have to ex we have to exploit. Sorry. We have to uh, uh, what do you call uh, uh, exploit or ex uh, because exploration is over. Now we have to start taking or we'll start going into that. I think this Nathan uh, Gadkari only who had said in one of this uh, meeting, I remember that. But the irony of it all, in 2012, the ISA has given China rights, explo ex exploration, exploitation rights, in the Southwest Indian Ocean region, so which is not very far from us. So just imagine now China from there will be doing their mining, et cetera, here. That's why he wants all these little territories because he can't keep going up and down. And he will be going around over my, around my CIOB, which is mine. So I have to, therefore that increases my, uh, my security. 
you apply for you apply you apply and uh, they got it you apply and they got it we were founder members we should have got the best that anyway we did get something and we took quite some time to exploit it, explore it because for various reasons but notwithstanding uh, that is the that is the truth right the cost the coastal and waterfront security is therefore very very critical given the volatile scenario in the indo pacific region i'm not talking of only china i'm also talking of whatever is happening on the east coast of uh, africa and you know whatever happens there and we have also some non uh, some states who use non state actors uh, to come into our waters the asymmetry enjoyed by non state actors makes it extremely challenging for the security forces using conventional means i mean to expect the navy and the coast guard and now before i go further the area the territorial sea is in, and the inland inland thing is with the coast guard they, it is their responsibility and when you come to the coast then marine police you know you have the marine police with them which was set up after the 9/11 uh, sorry uh, 2011 then between the territorial sea and the eas uh, the responsibility is shared between the navy and the indian coast guard the navy is responsible beyond the eas uh, all by itself which means the navy uh, is there up to your 12 thing when i say responsibility they have given specific responsibility but as you know in all these things we share information we share and thing and we probably even share assets because uh, we belong to the same country uh, thank god uh, yeah uh, arna mentioned to you about the maritime domain awareness this infrastructure that has been put in place largely covers the sea surface element they use the electromagnetic magnetic uh, you know uh, thing which exists space or radar coast to get information about the position of ships uh, or for that matter use ais to find out which ships are coming where when they are moving where they moving etc and they get a thing and uh, this mda is also being shared with our neighbors so we get their mda they get mda so definitely this has been set up very well now and is i understand because i am out of the navy i am only supposed to understand now i understand that it is doing well and uh, uh, there there are a lot of there is a lot of work going on Uh, because there are, you always have some youngsters who once worked with you and now are doing big jobs there so they keep telling you so humne ye kiya wo kiya so you get some little bit of thing there is an urgent requirement to build the infra request infrastructure to monitor the underwater domain now we are talking of monitor the underwater domain of our maritime zone and build intelligence in the on the ground in and in the coastal areas because finally the guy is going to reach the coast if he miss everything else so finally the intelligence should be even available at the coast that is the maritime police should know everybody should know the uda framework i'm using the word framework now which in cause will require very specialized focus and related science and technology technology support uh when i say that uh probably uh arnabe said that he's done all this then he's done the theoretical studies he's validated it to some extent but there's a lot more that we need to go secondly arnab is one india's 10 people what about the skill levels that we need to develop to to take this as a, as a, as a national requirement it will also require a comprehensive infrastructure to manage the digital transition because there will be server required this that it like he with his one and half servers borrowing it from this is not going to work so it has to be done why i'm saying or not why i'm saying mrc i'll come to that specific projects need to be taken up to build in house capacity and capability we have to take specific projects infrastructure and capabilities also need to be built now i've been talking only on on this course and anna will they not <clears throat> pardon me if i don't mention brahmaputra so infrastructure and capabilities also need to be built to keep track of the underwater domain of the freshwater systems especially related to transboundary river like he mentioned 
and don't forget the water stretches where we are having today in the Galwan Valley. We have huge water stretches. We have never even thought of having an underwater domain awareness there. We would know a lot more things of what's happening because I'm sure those guys are uh, who have now part, part of that lake would be doing something. The tropical waters of the Indian Ocean region, which he has said uh, in his presentation, present unique challenges. Now, I will not only say about sonar or sound, and the, the challenges are many. How are you going to measure in this huge area? How, what, how many points will you have for measurement? How many things? So, is it possible? Yeah, A. Okay, even if it's possible, is it feasible? A possibility? Yeah, why not? But is it feasible? So, we have to have practical solutions. And the unique characteristics of the underwater domain in this region is fundamental, as he said, for optimal, optimal, optimal performance of technologies being used. I'm not just using sonar. There are a lot more. Because even when you're going uh, uh, to, or whatever thing, they also, it's not just the sonar, even the, the AUV itself, We are talking of sometimes 600 meters. So we have to be thinking of those also. So the technologies will be different. We will require to formulate, as you rightly, indigenous solutions. I'm not using the word indigenous equipment only. Even the solution has to be indigenous. As imported solutions, because equipment is good everywhere, but the solution is not. Because if it is working there well, why is it not working here? It's because of your physiology here. So therefore, because this is this particular equipment is optimized for there. A sensor is a sensor, right? I'm 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 talking of a sensor. I'm not talking of a sonar per se, which is a up and down. I'm talking of a sensor. Uh, I, I'm specifically you know mentioning these things because he's an underwater expert, so he may. Will require to formulate indigenous solution as imported solutions and equipment optimized for water bodies of other regions, forget about best and thing, even thing, would present every time and always suboptimal performance here. And therefore, whatever we do here has to be homegrown. This is not just Atma Nirbhar, it is a requirement. Otherwise, you're not going to have a proper uh, solution. Local, as, as I mentioned, you have this huge uh, region, right? Is the solution going to be the same in the whole region? Definitely not. So local site-specific R&D is a critical requirement. Modeling studies and implementation. Uh, you people have made a lot of model. because that has to be done for which you require the skill sets and the uh, capabilities because it's not just one region you there are a lot of regions that one has to go through ai based data analytics and high performance computing will be the key requirements there is no doubt about that digital signal processing algorithms need to be prioritized because obviously the the information is in digital form now so whatever processing you do will you will dsp and that's my name uh, all algorithm needs to be prioritized, uh, and I, I'm I'm a DSP man. Actually, I'm a DSP man. Uh, to be prioritized to build site-specific models to map ground realities. We are fortunate that in this area, the government, especially the Ministry of Earth Sciences and their various laboratories, have been doing some work. Right, you can. They may be getting data. They... What what data useful for us? If it is useful for one uh, stakeholder, can it be useful for others? Why do you want to have two data chains when you can have one data chain? So that those are the uh, uh, you know things that we should be looking at. 
Digital Ocean, the state of art data, uh, art, uh, data platform for ocean data management developed by in, uh, the Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services, provides ocean data related to services at all in one place. So you can go tap from it. And I, I understand MRC has got a MOU uh, with uh, NIOC. So you have your data now, you know, because otherwise you are generating your data in the beginning. However, underwater domain expertise is a big gap. That data is available. So what do you do with that data? Yeah. How, how do you interpret it with respect to the conditions of that region, especially the underwater uh, conditions? Particularly, that will you have to be thing based know how that know how thing. So in our skill development, etc., one of the things that we should definitely be looking at more developers who make algorithms for underwater uh, specific uh, problems. That 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 has to think because that is if when Arnab said nobody is working, a lot of people are working in underwater, but they don't know what they're doing in underwater. They are they're doing all like you say academic solutions. He was also an academic in underwater. He must have done a thing. But being a naval officer, he understood and therefore, you know, thing. So that has to be brought in even amongst the kids who are doing the thing. If they are going to do with MRC, fine, they will bring in. But MRC, as I said, is only local, so we have to uh, do that. Lab-based R&D needs to translate to field experimental validation. Now, this data that you got, when you've just seen the changes that happen in a day, in a season, in a thing which he brought out. So it has to be, so, okay, fine, we work with that data, then we go to that region, we carry out. And this gap that is noticed, that needs to be fed back to the inquiries for which you are in a very good position to do your feedback to inquiries so that other things that the blue economy people etc who go into that they get the benefit out of that right the civil society and academia i mean this is very important and this is a story that has been going on uh, since 19 uh, since, uh, since uh, i got involved in uh, 1973 74 75 at iit delhi uh, IIT Delhi, we set up a center where he also trained uh, for underwater, basically. But that is the only academia portion, academia got left. And we've had several, several discussions at the ministry level at, uh, you know, uh, thing. But, but we say it should be, it, it, it should be, the civil society need to step forward, step forward and participate in a high end real world problem solving initiatives. Uh, some time ago, for some reason, I was a member of the IIT Council and we had a meeting in of the IIT Council in Delhi where the minister and uh, I think um, Dr. Kakodkar had written a paper on this thing uh, on the academia and thing or all that. IIT Bombay was there. IIT Bombay was doing a lot of work. So my question one is, you're doing all the work, but how much has it gone to the poor man? How much has it gone to the man? We're doing a lot of work, but it has to translate into back to the thing, which means that connection has to be there. We have done research, we made a thing, we know it is possible, but that's the end of it. So that has to be, uh, that, that also, the, the When I say they, uh, what you call, uh, participate, I mean, this portion, portion of the participate by industry and academia has to, I think. MRC, I think, is best placed to facilitate and handhold this requirement. And especially uh, now with uh, your uh, association with the industries, your uh, manpower requirements, your skill level requirements will also think so that we've, you could go grow in this area and find these uh, things. You're also aware about what's happening in IIT Bombay. You know what's happening in IIT Delhi. We've done a lot of work there, right? You, I think he was the only person who would work on problems for the Navy, 
So he got problems. Of course, his professors and he, whom, whom we know, could do. Uh, right, so what? How did anybody else benefit from it? Navy and thing. I, how do the common man benefit? At the end of it, that should be what we'll be looking at. When we are going in, in this kind of thing, how do common man benefit? Security solutions to our problems, uh, especially in my program where I used his brain. Do we have the knowledge and capability to do the, all this indigenously? I will answer with a very magnified yes, because in my last program, uh, which I was there, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I can say it now because I think it's published. So uh, in the first boat, we had about 30 to 40 percent indigenous. The rest was thing because we. But in the very second boat, uh, since I was involved with about four of them, yeah, I think that's also now disclosed because it is there in the thing. The uh, we were seventy five percent, and the boat after that, before I left, there were only five equipment I needed to indigenize. Who was doing this? Not big companies, small entrepreneurs, small. SMEs, you know, SMEs, those people, and you'll be surprised, 150 SMEs around Pune and all have contributed to my boat. So it is there. So can they do it? Yes. But a lot of handholding, because they don't have the domain. So we have to sit with them to do it. So if you really, if we really want, we have to sit with the industry. So just to say industry should do and academy should do will not work. We have to sit with them. So we have to find the resources to sit with them and get them to do it because then they get interested because you are there all the time. So that's an important thing, which I uh, uh, think because several times we have said academy or this, that, et cetera, but then we leave it for the next meeting. But if we sit with them through and through, we will find solutions. The answer, as I said, is a, is a qualified yes, including the sonar because we've done it, but you will require something it can be done we had areas they have been uh, they've been uh, uh, because we are now making ships we are making submarines in this country so obviously we have sonars that will work around this country right yes there were issues when we import them there's a different issue because we are getting his but we are able to do that with our sonars and uh, uh, we we as all of you must have heard of commodore paul raj you know who's who's the who's our father in in the sonar field in india right uh, he he put us through this and I was one of the fortunate guys to be one of his youngsters and uh, learned a lot from him and we've been able to do that issue is all this exists in silos and actually we need to democratize it uh, for the benefit of all stakeholders in the underwater domain within the nation and also among the nations in the region where we can if MDA can be given, some parts of UDA, not all, because what's in your region, you can't. What's in the, uh, in the uh, open sea, we can definitely share with our neighbors. I, I presume this is what I, I don't know what the Navy would think about it. Normally, we won't, because that's where your submarines will be there. So this will require capacity and capability building at multiple levels. There is thus a serious requirement of setting up a multidisciplinary multifunctional center of excellence. There is, there is no doubt about it, so that people can pour into that center of excellence to expect the, the resource to give you the answers or let go anything is not going to happen. It, is, it will have to be the center of excellence where it is an interaction. When, when I, I, I was involved with my last project, I had more interactions with the universities with the um, uh, yeah, research institutes uh, to be able to tell them my point of view or my requirement explain it to them listen to their problems get back say okay you can do this etc so you 
So that can happen in an environment which is where an academic or a center of excellence, and it's not say the Navy or something because their their job is different. So don't expect them to become, you know, thing. So you will have to build build that uh, thing. Same here when it comes to merchant ships. Why should they reduce the uh, their noise? They will spend more money. They don't want to spend more money. <clears throat> so we'll have to drive that through the design stage of the ships design that there is that no design will be agreed to unless these following are met because once it goes into building the person who is getting the ship built is not going to lose money these are things that we need to keep in mind finally i think all of you are waiting for this word technology as an enabler whatever was finally you're waiting for not not technology as an enabler for strategic security framework does not mean just the hardware and the software implementation. I mean, that thing, because I was asked to talk about technology as an enabler. So I want to just say it's got not just the technologies that go into it. Technology enablers, I'm using not this thing. Technology enablers includes governments, both state and central, regulatory authorities, organizations, that facilitate technology absorption. So those are the technology enablers, which I would like to uh, think uh, through standards, because when you're going to work across the thing, you have to standards, guidelines, policies, and definitely funding and investment. It has to be that way for us uh, to be able to have a, uh, um, uh, to reach the levels that we're looking for, which is an absolute necessity. It's no more a desire. It's a necessity in the in the in the uh, in the in in the environment that we live today. Uh, with that, I will I think uh, finish for today. I hope I will be able to convey what uh, what uh, uh, I wanted to uh, in in a, in a in a very you know general way. But uh, it is important that uh, uh, this thing when I when we talked about is basically looking for capacity and capability building in this region because now underwater domain awareness is I think well known uh, well known by the stakeholder the the uh, providers the uh, the stakeholders who are the providers uh, patiently Thank you, and of course to the uh, people on the other end. Thank, Thank you. you so much, sir. Uh, I would now request uh, uh, Mr. Prashant Girwane, Director General of Maratha Chamber, to kindly say, uh, give his comments, please. Thank you so much, Maradas. General Shekhatkar, sir, uh, past president of the chamber, Mr. Malhotra, all the dignitaries here and online. The importance of topic has been explained by Kamado Das and many experts have talked and would be talking about it. I would limit my commentary to just a couple of points. Uh, when there is discussion a few minutes ago about a potential collaboration with the chamber, so I think that's all that I would want to talk about. I'll give an example of what kind of collaboration has worked in chamber so that maybe we can drive something from those learnings and build it up grounds up. A couple of years ago, we won A in MCCIA. To cut the long story short, we connected with Sarangi Saab, who used to be additional chief secretary in government of Maharashtra, focused on agriculture. Because in chamber, while thanks to the legacy of 88 years, we get to do a lot of things. There are only about 50 people, out of which only about 30 people who are not assistants, out of which only about 15 people who are supposed to kind of take some decisions about it. It still works. The reason it still works is because all the past presidents, board directors, executive committee members, or even outsiders come forward and say, I have this expertise and I'll make it work. And then chamber says, okay, we'll put the name behind and we'll make it work and we'll put some secretarial staff and all of this. That initiative by Sarangi Saab has helped a couple of thousand farmers over the last eight to nine months in helping them understand about potential for exports. So much so that there have been connects between buyer and seller to make that happen. The various 
programs that we conduct here, which are for capability building and scaling programs. Nilesh, can I have that copy? Please. Thank you. Just the program called Level Up Program, and about 55 programs are conducted in different areas. I'll leave a copy with you, Kamada Das. Thank you. That alone tells that there are 9,000 individuals who came to this chamber. And I'm telling exact number 9,000 individuals came to the chamber, 9,620. 4,295 organizations benefited from some of the 250 total programs that we would have conducted. So, of course, it's in the sweet spot to conduct programs and help training to happen. The essential thing is because we would not have, forget underwater domain, we don't have expertise on any domain. We have expertise of catching hold of domain experts bolting them on a platform and making it happen. That expertise we have got. So as long as you bring that, the proposals that you talked about, now, for example, in the agri sector itself, we have worked with the sector skill council and rest of it. If there is any proposal that is written, we are happy to look at it so that we are able to use the expertise that you have an MCCI's name to, to get the resources here so that we further support the activities that are being conducted by MRC and others. So I think that's all that I would say here. Uh, I still have a minute and a half, so I'll say something uh, very, very important. I think I learned it from Dr. Kirkar and Dr. Mashilkar when we were building the PS in the early days, Pune International Center. Uh, they always talked about, and the Malhotra Sahib has been a trustee there, and now Dr. Anade is also trustee. They always talked about importance of institutions, but they always say how there is an individual behind the staying at it for this long and continuing to stay at it because without that, it wouldn't come here. So thank you uh, for another engagement that I had promised uh, at 6.15, uh, but I'll pick up. I mean, though very short, but I think you hit the nail right where it is required to be hit. And thank you so much. And uh, me and Malhotra sir will be definitely carrying forward this conversation. And uh, as you said, whatever we are supposed to do, we promise that we will do it. And uh, uh, we will use the framework and the entire platform of uh, MCCI under your guidance to take it forward. Thank you so much. Uh, I would now request uh, General <laughs> from having a long career, very distinguished career in the Army. Uh, sir has been the DG of the Assam Rifles. And uh, after that, he continued as the chairman of the <laughs> uh, ceasefire committee for the Naga Talks. Sir, uh, I would request you to kindly, I'm sorry we are a little late on time, but I would request you to kindly make your comments. Thank you for joining us, sir. Uh, thank you, Arnab. Thank you for inviting me to your conference. I'm sorry I could not be with you physically uh, because I'm in Mumbai uh, and uh, unfortunately could not return in time for the conference but uh, it, it's been very enlightening to hear uh, your views as well as uh, the views of admiral Obama. and uh, always uh, i always feel very privileged to listen to domain experts because uh, they have so much to share with us i i will be actually uh, talking about the insurgency of the northeast and the prevailing non-state actors uh I'll, I'll just try and share my presentation i'm unfortunately tied out between the between this technology wall and i'm a technology non-expert but let me try and sort of just push put a few issues to your mind the first issue is of course uh we we looked at the 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 issues in detail this is the way i want to cover it uh, I have been, as Arnab has said, uh, uh, spent a long time in the Northeast, spent a long time uh, fighting the country's insurgencies of the Northeast. And post uh, my uh, retirement as the Director General of the Assam Rifles in, uh, in 2018, I was appointed uh, as the Chairman of the Ceasefire Monitoring Group, as well as an advisor to the uh, Home Ministry on the insurgencies in the Northeast. Well, what is the Northeast actually? Uh, 2.62 lakh kilometers, 3.1% of India's population, 
40 million people from diverse origins, tribes, religions, and beliefs, and about 220 different languages and dialects. It's a great conglomeration of different, different kinds of people. But if you look at the map of India and you look at the Northeast, uh, it, it gives you a very clear indicator that in this very, very large space, Northeast of India is actually surrounded by nations. All those nations are in economically far poorer than, than India. Uh, all the nations look at the Indian economic miracle as something that they would like to take part in, at least their people would, but at the same time cannot deal with the internal ins insecurities and insurgencies within those countries. So much of these insurgencies are actually, uh, you know, move from those countries and come towards India. Some, of course, are homegrown. There are a large number of smaller, smaller groups that uh, belong to very small communities which feel insecure in India. So based on these insecurities, uh, these insurgencies arise. And these insurgencies can then affect the larger security situation in the country. I would have loved to show you my slide on this particular thing, but uh, unfortunately I can't. So the what is, a, what is the problem in the Northeast? Firstly, the border security. As you know, the Assam Rifles, after the Kargil War uh, Committee report, uh, was, was instituted as in that one border, one, one force, was made responsible for the Indo-Myanmar border. The Indo-Myanmar border is actually 776 kilometers long. Uh, but the Assam Rifles has only 46 battalions. And despite all our requests for increasing the strength, the Home Ministry had not increased the strength, but only recently now has permitted the Assam Rifles to raise five more battalions. So it means 51 battalions of four companies ahead uh, for 1776 kilometers. That means each company actually is looking after an area of something like 20 to 25 kilometers with, with about 100 men. That is an, almost an impossibility if you're going to really look at the security of this place. The second is the Northeast uh, predominant strategic location in South Asia. Once again, you just have to look at the map to tell you that uh, the Northeast is actually the most threatened part of the country because uh, surrounding its landmass are the countries of Myanmar, the countries of uh, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan. And surrounding those countries is, is what we call the second ring is Tibet, which is, of course, uh, right now occupied by China. So you have 15,000 square kilometers of borders with seven countries. The internal security challenges are inextricably uh, linked to border management. And because of this border management, you have a large insurgency problem. And India's economic growth has actually generated peculiar problems like illegal migration. And this illegal migration could be for terrorism, for insurgency, for narco, for smuggling, uh, for economic movement. It can be for any issue. But the main issue is that this threat is there and the threat is increasing. And as you know, all the waters that Arnab talked about, he talked about the Brahmaputra, he talked to all these smaller internal rivers that finally drain into the Brahmaputra. All these internal rivers, and we are the middle repairing. So you have the waters coming in from Tibet or China, you have the waters coming in from Myanmar, you have the waters going towards Bangladesh, uh, and you have a huge lot of communities, smaller communities living in these, uh, the, 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 along these waters that may be a part of this insurgency. So all in all, these waters are being used for illegal smuggling, these with what the waters are being used for narco-terrorism, these waters are being used for, uh, for, for insurgencies. And because of the limited force that we have, there's very little that India can actually do about this at the present moment. So I completely agree with you, Arnab, that we are at, at a point of history where unless we realize the kind of uh, pressure there is 
on our security forces unless we realize the kind of uh, threats that exist along these waters we will we will find it very difficult in the future to actually stop this in these insurgencies or stop these waters from being used you talk to the silt and the brahmaputra but you were talking from the economic point of view from the uh, from the the threat on the along its waters from the narco threat from the insurgency threat it is almost an impossibility to stop it's almost an impossibility so this this is one issue that i've really been wanting to flag i have flagged this issue uh, many times actually uh, you know talking about this uh, talking about this to the uh, to 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 the home ministry talking about this to the home secretary to the home minister that unless you understand that the kind of threat that exists uh, along the borders of, uh, of 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 india and then beyond the borders of india like for example let's talk of the borders of myanmar now if you just go back and general chakatka will uh, will remember this because this this was one issue that i had flagged even in the uh, you know uh, during the time when he was uh, when when he was uh, compiling the shaketkar committee report the issue about the security beyond myanmar uh, is that if you just go to world war 2 and you see the way uh, japan entered india in world war 2 they came in uh, through myanmar through burma and came through the somra tracks into finally imphal and from imphal downward to kohima where they were finally defeated by the british but if they had not been defeated by by the british indian troops at kohima uh, they could have reached dimapur and also cut off the brahmaputra basin so when i told him that this threat exists today for the chinese pla to come through the same route because the same route is open and even more so today because Myanmar is in an extremely fragile position. It is it is amazing that nobody has actually uh, like uh, like you are doing this domain expertise and domain study on uh, on maritime borders. No one has actually studied the threat that exists to India from the northeastern borders and especially from Myanmar. Uh, I then further went across and uh, went to Bangladesh to have a word with the uh, border guards of Bangladesh. earlier it was the bangladesh rifles which was disbanded after the mutiny and then became the border guards bangladesh uh when i asked them about the threat from the waters and threat from uh, threat from the various insurgents or smaller community insurgents that existed there uh you know from their blank faces i could make out that uh, they had not given this account so when these kind of anomalies exist along the periphery of india's borders it is essential actually for us to understand that the smaller communities which live on the peripheries of these great rivers of uh, of the tributary rivers uh, are actually communities that feel the most insecurity as india grows and these are the communities that are the first target for any kind of inimical country trying to create an insurgency or start a terrorism start terrorism here i in my job as uh, the chairman of the ceasefire monitoring group had the opportunity actually to talk with the, the insurgent leaders uh, the naga insurgent leaders the the zuf the zeliangrong insurgent uh, united front uh, i also had a word with the pla and was talking to a whole lot of other insurgent leaders and i could make out that they 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 move between the borders of myanmar bangladesh and india with impunity in fact a uh, very funny aside we once again because jan chakitka was in foco uh if i remember right was uh, yeah, that i was attending the wedding of uh, that the nsc and im's uh, leader atem his son's wedding and atem had invited me and sitting behind me was uh, was was chetia of the ulfa so uh, i said i asked him i said aren't you chetia he says yes i am and walked away with the devil may care attitude so uh, the issue is that these insurgent leaders actually move from one point to the other with the greatest of imp- imp- impunity so that's the first issue that i wanted to flag is that this insurgency will continue 
because it is actually uh, providing jobs and you know providing uh, you know financial uh, a great deal of financial uh, no i can't say assistance but 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 being used by the by the insurgents by the by powers that are inimical to india to uh, to to smuggle in and to, to create narco terrorism which again fuels the insurgency in the country now what are the problems here firstly how does you know what is what is the issue the issue is that we don't have efficient customs and border control at all we we must start developing these efficient these customs and border control situations so that these the trade and economic growth which anyway is a part of all communities across both borders can can grow at least and lack of these border controls mainly because the lack of uh, forces that are along the indo myanmar border create cross border terrorism infiltration ex exfiltration of insurgents and a great deal of non state actors trafficking of arms narcotics human cattle every possible situation is is actually trafficked from between these borders there is a, a great deal of illegal immigration uh, separatist movements aided and abetted by the foreign powers nexus of miscreants and criminals with lower rank political leaders and officials i i, I since it's a closed uh, closed uh, seminar I, i can well say that at least 30% of the political leaders in northeast states are connected uh, to the miscreants criminals and insurgent groups and this improper broad border management because a large number of forces that are involved uh, ha has created a very volatile internal situation uh, within these border states and this one border one force though is the, though in the hands of the assam rifles uh, because of the peculiar issue of the assam rifles being officered by the army has resulted in a gross uh, lack of assistance by the ministry of home affairs to the assam rifles so let me just come to why are these communities in a problem if you study the historical background to to these communities coming into india you will realize that uh, there was a great trans migration of communities uh, along around uh, 1500 bc and this continued right till the 1800s when uh, when 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 uh, the burmese empire had taken over most of the northeast and these smaller communities had moved to the northeast to continue uh, you know trying to trying to eke out a living and both the communities and the people have cultural uh, have uh, cross connects now this cross connect actually shows if you if you take your mind back to the recent uh, problem in uh, in myanmar you know the 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 uh, the crackdown by the myanmar army or by the tatmadaw resulted in uh, two issues it resulted in a lot of uh, refugees coming into india and though we wanted to stop them in uh, along the, the 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 states that share this indo myanmar border that means uh, nagaland uh, manipur Uh, Mizoram and Arunachal. Mizoram, uh, the state of Mizoram said that we we cannot stop the, the these refugees because they are our kith and kin from outside. And no matter how much we tried, because of a lack of a border fence, uh, which frankly no, I must tell you can never be built, uh, it resulted in almost forty uh, thousand people actually coming inside the state of Mizoram and. they are probably still there because they have come and stay as are staying with their relatives so this is this is a this is an issue it is endemic to the northeast because of the communities that live on both sides and because of our inability to actually enforce control why is this inability there because of the kind of terrain there is because of the kind of drainage there is because of the kind of waters there are because of the kind of uh, forests there are all in all it's almost an impossibility to actually cover these uh, cover these borders and the only way we can really cover these borders is that if we are able to to bring to people's notice or bring to the country's notice that the, everyone suffers if this insurgency grows so this is something that i have been wanting to flag for a while 
and uh, you know uh, the, these cross connects are something that I've been wanting to tell, uh, talk about because it's an impossibility for us to stop these insurgencies and stop these people from moving there until these insurgencies continue. The 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 the, the security situation in the northeast will continue to be a problem. So to to understand why this insurgency uh, continues, why this problem happens, there is a small situation that in this small, uh, you know, I, I would like you to sort of try and draw uh, uh, one circle. In the center of the circle is the community. And that community is the basis on which why this insurgency thrives. The community, the local community, is the center of gravity of all insurgencies. And this community is central to, must be central to our plans to improve the security there. And uh, this is one issue <coughs> which I thought that I must flag again, that unless we ensure that these minority communities are given and are, are, are given the security, that their cultural interests will not be harmed. Till then, it will be impossible to stop this insurgency. I know it's been, uh, it's a little late for all of you, so I'll end my presentation here. But thank you so much for uh, Arnab for calling me and uh, asking me to talk about something that is dearest to my heart. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's uh, very important, and I think you brought out some very important points and we'll take this discussion forward uh, sometime uh, later and take it for uh, i mean see how we can contribute to uh, making some difference thank you so yeah. much sir uh, sir jain sir i would request you to kindly make your comments sir am i am i, am I audible yes sir you're yes, audible sir. yes sir it's it's rather late so i'll be very brief uh, I just want to tell you that uh, some kind of legal framework has now emerged and I'm going by what the MHA report of 21-22 says. Uh, Admiral Verma had made a comment uh, about the Indian Navy's responsibility, but now MHA says that Indian Navy has now been designated as the authority responsible for overall maritime security, which includes coastal and offshore security Indian Navy assisted by ICG, Coastal Police and other central and state agencies will look after the security. So I presume now probably the charter of Indian Navy has been made very clear. Um, it's, it's rather uh, late in the evening. I would just like to mention what all has happened uh, on the coastal security um, in the last few years. Uh, the first uh, time we actually got aware of the sea lines of communication and coastal waters was in 1993, when the smugglers' routes were turned into terrorist routes by Daud Ibrahim gang, and uh, RDX was smuggled in, in spite of the fact that we had all the agencies working as usual on the coastline. And uh, that actually showed that having customs and having ICG was not enough, and we needed something more than that. The serial bomb blast that took place on March 12, 1993, had killed 257 civilians and injured more than 1,400, leading to lifelong disabilities. So what was the government reaction? There was a knee-jerk reaction from the government of Maharashtra. And they converted every coastal police station into marine police station. And the staff was redesignated as marine police. No special training was given. No infrastructure was created. They simply changed the boards. Instead of marine police, uh, instead of coastal police stations, we had marine police stations. So uh, naturally, uh, nothing much happened on the coastal security. At the time, I was working in the Special Bureau in Mumbai, and one could see that we were totally unprepared, and ICG did not even have proper charter of duties. They did not have police powers in the uh, territorial waters. They could not board the vessel, or if they could, 
they won't be able to arrest or prosecute anybody. Now that has been changed. Now ICG charter has been modified. So again, there is some legal framework whereby uh, ICG can take action against uh, the vessels uh, doing illegal activities in Indian waters. I want to briefly mention about uh, what happened in 2008. Again, the same routes, the smugglers' routes were used by the Pakistanis to smuggle in several years. And we had another instance that was 2611 when again carnage happened. Uh, and I, I still wonder how uh, that boat could get right up to the shore of uh, Mumbai in spite of having all the agencies uh, working on the, on, on, the, on the coastline. This shows that there's some kind of porosity in spite of all the things that we do on the, post, uh, on the coastal security. Department of Border Management has been implementing coastal security scheme uh, for the last nearly 18 years. And if you see the outlay, outlay has been of 646 crores of rupees. They have created 73 coastal police stations, 97 check posts, 58 outposts, etc., etc. Uh, but the main thing is the incident of 2611 was not probably pro proper, properly uh, inquired into. In fact, Ram Pradhan and V. Balchandran Inquiry Committee report, it was kept secret even from Maharashtra police, who were asked to implement its recommendations and submit action taken report. A special post of DG Special Operations was created to satisfy public anger and later abolished after the first incumbent retired. Now, since then, the government of India has taken many measures uh, there is a joint operation center established. Uh, maritime uh, coastal security has been uh, streamlined. The director general of ICG has been designated as commander coastal command and is responsible for overall coordination between central and state agencies in all matters relating to coastal security. Uh, then there is coastal security scheme phase two. Once again, they have added some police stations. They have conducted vulnerability gap analysis. Uh, infrastructure has been created. Uh, Maharashtra on its own has started upgrading 14 jetties of Maharashtra Maritime Board by constructing engine rooms, operational rooms, etc. Then the security of non-major and minor ports has also been undertaken. There are some 227 non-major ports in coastal states. A compendium of guidelines on security of non-major ports has been circulated. Then the security of single point mooring has also been considered. And there are other coastal security initiatives like community interaction programs. Then uh, there, are, there is a program for tacking of vessels and boats. There's a program on coastal mapping. Then the coastal police stations have been notified uh, in Maharashtra, it is the uh, Yellow Gate Police Station that, which has been designated. There is also a proposal to start National Ac Academy of Coastal Policing, NSCP, and the site has been approved in uh, Devbhumi, Dwarka, Gujarat. So, uh, many uh, measures have been taken. I would like to just mention two things. First thing is, we are very good in planning but we are poor in implementation. So most of these measures, many times they just remain on paper and one has to be very careful when you draw a plan, unless someone follows it up and sees that it is properly implemented, you are going to have a big mess uh, on your hand. Second thing is the corruption in, in the uh, various security agencies. I still remember when I was recording statement of a person from customs, during 1993, he mentioned that, sir, we are also patriots. We didn't know that they were smuggling in RDX. We thought that it was normal gold, silver, and watches. So any kind of security setup, if it gets compromised like this, then once again, you are going to have a very big problem on your hand. In the end, I would like to mention that uh, 
what arnav mentioned was really uh, very revealing i must say that in our puranas there is a reference to samudra manthan and everything from poison to amrut comes out of samudra probably it's an allegorical uh, statement allegorical story which basically describes the underwater domain and the possibilities that are there so thanks a lot for uh, asking me to participate in this seminar i'm sorry i cannot be very uh, detailed today because i have to rush there is another meeting and it's a dashera and uh, probably i know it shows your commitment to this subject that on a dashera day assamese or a bengali attending seminar is something unheard of thank you so much thank you so much sir and thank you very much for your very insightful comments thank you very much sir i would now request uh, uh, dr ajit anade sir to kindly make his comments but the thought just and i am very happy to see that you actually covered 100 miles in the last several years i want to second what the uh, voice behind you but really it's an face everywhere so tremendous energy and and passion and you really brought a lot of multidisciplinary in fact uh, mr manikar had left but i wanted to tell him that we are also doing some work with the dgp in maharashtra so we we are also trying to be interdisciplinary at gokhale institute i just want to make two or three comments one is that uh, i noticed uh, devya right and uh, shail shumela and Sun sunita are the only three men in this group nine is by men sir you are losing out on 50% of your of your constituency there is no point point in gokhale institute actually 70% of our students are women bsc msc and phd so if we are going to partner with you you have to make it participatory for women as well That's No, no, please. I, I'm not making a flippant. I'm not making a flippant point because this these matters go, these matters go beyond security and armed forces. I think it's very important. So that's a, that's the point. I just no, especially because today's discussion is far beyond security and armed forces. It's so uh, in even in engineering, sir, fifty percent students who join uh, admissions are actually women even not just yes. electrical engineering but even mechanical and so on as divya will tell you so it's very important that's the point second point is that um, united and privileged to associate uh, with you uh, what we will do is i'll tell you very concrete way of doing it we are now introducing in all of our courses when i say courses i mean programs msc in economics msc in international economics msc in financial economics msc in agri business msc in population and health studies we don't yet have maritime studies but that will come but in all these courses we are going to introduce so these courses run for 2 years i should call them programs and they have typically they do over 2 years they do 20 courses each course has 3 credits so we are going to compulsorily include now maybe 3 or 6 credits for doing a term paper and that term paper can be specifically uh, actually customized for projects that you can offer there is not much uh, i think uh, monetary uh, burden for either of the two parties but this will get not only the student uh, the credit uh, and you know you, they will bring their passion you your guidance and that will be a techno Like for or or it has to is three credits means it go for the whole semester or maybe two months, and since you are based in Pune, we are based in Pune. Yeah. Uh, we should please take advantage of it. Uh, we'll discuss the details later. <laughs> we also we also want you to come and deliver. I'm talking specifically about our das. Maybe a, a series, a module of say seven lectures. We'll customize that on what you spoke today because I think you can uh, you can customize the talk or series of talks. where you make it applicable and relevant to the students of uh, because when we say economics actually we 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 teach economics sociology political science political economy demography statistics so we don't we are of course not an mba school or we are not engineering but there's fair amount of inter interdisciplinary i agree with you when you said that all the 17 or 27 17 sdgs have water connected so the way you presented it you presented a wonderful aspect that you know people think marriage the word maritime and domain these words you know all are associated with the, with the military and security this is something you know the your biggest stakeholders are not 50 plus people you know they are they are 40 minus or 30 minus as you know 27 uh, 50 per, you know the number of people between the age group of 4 and 18 is 52 crores in india 520 million 
you please try to reach out you know this passion that you have it's very it's not important just to work with the highest levels of people who are about 55 or 60 and who are policy makers <laughs> but but you have to engage with the youngsters and i'm offering you this university platform so two things the three credit course as term paper well well defined project uh, assignments it can be 5 10 15 whatever and secondly a series of lectures by you and then later on we will introduce a topic called maritime economy or economic aspects of the maritime uh, you know respect or you can combine security and all that so happy to do that we can i i would uh, once again welcome you to come to my institute i think last time we met only at the cafe probably so please come Third was very welcome you know he is a garwala because i have now enjoyed his hospitality at home the third thing i want to mention is that actually there are pune specific projects we have a center for sustainable development when you talk about desilting and the water security of pune and those four dams we can actually do a project uh, i'll be very happy if you can mr talera with your generosity you can support some project we'll do it over four to six months and this is a very very relevant project for our center for sustainable development or we can be jointly with mrc and uh, csd so that's another thing and um, i mean so i'm very happy about your presentation it's, uh, that i think you did capture uh, i hope uh, some of your talks uh, you have recorded something today you you extract those snippets video snippets this is a, it's a, a serious suggestion make it into five to seven minute uh, video snippets from your talk today or maybe some good clever editing some audio visual uh, value addition and make those short videos which we can circulate to our whatsapp groups this is the way to get a thousand megawatt passion here <laughs> but we need to <laughs> propagate so thank you very much again and happy dasra to all Thank you so much, sir. We'll take this discussion forward, and I would not hold everybody uh, any more. I'm sorry, it got a little uh, spilled over. Uh, thank you all so much for uh, being there today, and it's a festival day. I do agree, but uh, we still appreciate all of you having joined us. Uh, I think last quick word to Prash uh, to Prafulji. Thank you, all our esteemed speakers. Uh... Uh, I won't take all their names, but uh, and the distinguished delegates for being with us. Wish you a very happy Diwali. It's not just the Assamese and the Bengalis. It's all the Punjabis, the Marwaris, the, the Telugus, everyone. Uh, uh, it's difficult to spend time on a Dashera day for a conference. And thank you so much, all of you. Have a great Dashera. Wish you all the very best. And Dashera signifies that we should get out of our comfort zones and be at the cutting edge of today and that's the way forward. Thank you so much. Happy Dashera.